Hello. Once again, good morning to all for today's second session. Myself, Ben Thomas Umman, Assistant Professor, LBS College of Engineering, Kasargod. On the third day of our faculty development program on advances on earthquake engineering, sponsored by AICT and Adal Academy, I cordially welcome our resource person, Dr. Sreswi C., our beloved HOD, Anjali Ma'am, FDP Coordinator, Rajya Ma'am, and all my colleagues and dear participants to the sec to the second session. Before starting this session, let me introduce our resource person, Dr. Sreyasvi, who has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and further specialized in the area of structural engineering. She defended her thesis in 2019 and obtained PhD from NITK Soratkal. Her PhD dissertation was on probabilistic seismic hazard assessment and site characterization of Southwest India. She continued her research career as a postdoctoral scholar at IIT Gandhinagar. Currently, she works as a seismic hazard modeler in GEM Foundation located in Pavia, Italy. She has authorized journal articles, book chapters, and conference papers. She is also an active member of ASE, EERI, and SSA, and reviewer of reviewer for reputed journals in earthquake engineering. She has delivered lectures in FDPs, conferences, and other AICT-funded programs. Her area of interest includes structural and soil dynamics, earthquake engineering, and engineering seismology. Once again, I invite you all to this second session. Thank you. Oh, I can start? Yes, ma'am. OK, thank you. I hope my uh, screen is visible to everyone. Yes, ma'am, it's visible. OK, OK, thank you. Um, so uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as they have already introduced, I'm Shreya uh, I work as a seismic hazard scientist at uh, GEM Foundation. Um, so today I will be delivering uh, to the topic on uh, recent advances in earthquake resistant construction practices. Um, so uh, I have organized the presentation in such a way that we start with some of the basics of uh, earthquake impact on structures and what are the factors that actually contribute towards damage uh, that we observe in a structure and then slowly move further to the latest technologies that are available and uh, some of the latest technologies are still in the laboratory scale so we will be seeing uh, uh, different innovative products which are at different stages of research along with that so to begin with uh, first, we will talk about the ground shaking effects on structure. So it is a common uh, understanding that the seismic source, which is responsible for the generation of ground motion, is usually located at a certain depth from the uh, ground surface. So as you can see here, this um, diamond-shaped or a rhombus shaped or uh, seismic source what I've shown here. So this is where the rupture begins or the rupture is originated and the seismic waves generated due to this rupture gets propagated to a layered soil medium. And most of our structures are usually located on this la soil layered medium. And in very rare cases, our structures will have a bedrock sort of a condition. Uh, so, uh, there are different types of foundations as well. So it always depends on many criteria when we are, whenever we are talking about the ground shaking effects. So I've just shown you a schematic of how this actually happens. So as you know, whenever ground shaking happens, this there is like tendency for the structures to undergo damage. Another interesting observation that has been made over the years is that when uh, we consider certain earthquakes or um, or any earthquake for that matter the soil condition or the ground condition on which the structure is actually resting also plays a major role so uh, here in this case there uh, or in this picture they show 
three different site conditions. One is a solid bedrock, as you can see here. This is what we call it as a rock outcrop. Another one is wherever, wherever you have a poorly consolidated sediment, and then you have a well consolidated sediment, sorry, sediment, and so on. And also in some cases, it could be a water saturated um, a sand or a mud sort of a ground condition. So whenever, if it is a solid bedrock, like I uh, told you, if it is a rock outcrop, automatically uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a case of landslide having taken place when earthquake actually happens if it is a poorly consolidated uh, sediment as you can see here in the middle so uh, whenever there is a ground shaking there will be a readjustment of the soil structure and the, of course you will experience settlement and also the there is a chances of the structure having collapsed or having settled by certain inches or centimeters depending upon the ground condition as well as the level of shaking however on the other end if your structure is located on a solid bed rock it may not experience a, a shaking to that extent it could be a mild shaking and if we go for a well consolidated settlement it could be a moderate shaking and if it has a poorly consolidated settlement then there will be a strong shaking on the other end, if we have a water saturated sand or a mud, then there is always a chance of liquefaction. And you can see the presence of sand boils. So uh, probably in one of the earlier lectures given by my uh, PhD supervisor, Professor Kattavan Kattavan, I could have seen uh, the cases of liquefaction and also landslides. So this is uh, an example of uh, so uh, until now we try to understand the ground conditions that could impact the shaking of a structure. In addition to that, there is always uh, what we call it as a fundamental period of the structure, which will uh, usually also play a major role. So as you can see here, uh, we there are three uh, models. These are the prototypes which were done uh, in a uh, laboratory. So these three different prototypes actually represents uh, three different types of structures with different uh, resonant frequency or natural frequency. So when it is subjected to, uh, now it is being subjected to a low frequency motion. Um, so during uh, low frequency waves, the tall buildings we will always experience higher shaking. And um, one example of low frequency shaking is the Japan earthquake that happened in 2011. So as you can see, uh, this is how a tall structure would respond if there is a low frequency earthquake. On the other hand, if we um, go for a medium frequency waves, you can see a, a classic example of a medium frequency wave is a Mexico uh, 1985 earthquake, which happened. And usually the, uh, what I can say, the medium storied buildings will suffer a major damage. And similarly, if we go for a high frequency, which was the case of in IT um, 2010 earthquake. So there were more of short frequency earthquakes and hence uh, the buildings which were like very short, like one or two story buildings, they suffered maximum damage. So this is how we can say that depending upon the characteristics of the building, as well as the characteristics of the ground motion, the response of each and every structure could vary. So in the coming slides, we will see what are the other factors that could actually influence as well. So this is a, a a recreation of a San Fernando earthquake, which happened in 1903. So this earthquake was recreated after many years. And uh, I would uh, say that uh, uh, focus on the top story where people are trying to get out of the building, but they're not able to go. And so this is how the masonry buildings used to file, especially in the 1900s, uh, uh, the masonry construction was used uh, quite common. Uh, and uh, use of steel structures or reinforced concrete structures was not in boom. So that is when uh, this type of failure was observed. So uh, we will come to the behavior of buildings to ground shaking. So whenever we talk about a structure, there is there are different structural elements such as walls, beams, columns. And these different structural members are used to resisting a vertical load or what we call it as a gravity load. So 
if we want to design a structure for an earthquake as well, then the same structural elements will have to carry an horizontal load in addition to the already existing gravity load. So whenever we talk about a lateral load or an earthquake load, we are mainly interested in the bending and the shearing effects these lateral loads can actually induce. So when the bending uh, tension due to earthquake exceeds, the vertical compression or uh, the net tensile stress will occur. So uh, there are uh, different configurations of the building that is actually playing a crucial role. First is the building material properties. And uh, when we talk about material properties, we are interested in strength and compression, tension, shear, and also uh, whenever we talk about earthquake loading, there is a, a cyclic uh, loading type of an action wherein we see loading, unloading, or uh, in a repetitive cycles. So even the resilience of the structure as well as the material matters a lot when it comes to the uh, behavior of a building, especially with considering the earthquake loads. Apart from that, there are like dynamic characteristics such as the periods, uh, 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 building period, uh, damping, and so on. And apart from that, there is load deflection characteristics, which also plays a major role. So, uh, what I would like to highlight uh, from this is, as you can see here, this is a section of the building and how uh, it is moving and in general, this is before we consider any earthquake loading. We can see the transverse vibration, we can see the vertical vibration, and we can see the longitudinal vibration. So depending upon the direction in which the load is applied, the frame is going to behave accordingly. So uh, what exactly is the resistant force for an earthquake loading? So as we know, earthquake load is a lateral force. So obviously the uh, mass of the building, which acts as an inertial force, is the a uh, repellent or the resultant for the acting lateral load. Similarly, uh, if we consider a freestanding masonry wall, so here, uh, if you see the first figure, we here it is just subject subjected to a gravity loading, and obviously there will be some sort of uh, tension and compression developed in these systems. So whenever we are subjecting it to a uh, what do you call it as a lateral load then obviously there you you can expect some sort of shearing or some sort of more uh, torsional movement as you can see in this one so here uh, the one represents actually the uh, uh, lateral load that is being subjected to so similarly uh whenever we are talking uh, about different structural elements uh first we let now let us consider the case of a wall here again it depends on in which direction the load is being applied to the wall so of course if the load is applied uh, perpendicular to the longer uh, dimension of the wall it uh, causes overturning and sometimes even the ratio that is the width uh, or length toward uh, to the width ratio is also play uh, also plays a major role so whenever you have a larger of uh, length to width ratio the behavior of the uh, uh, structural unit would be different and if it is moderate it would be different and if it is small then it will be different so as you can see here uh, whenever you have a larger length to width ratio a uh, well developed and well established diagonal shear cracks can be seen when it, whenever it is smaller you don't see much damage so this is how a typical wall unit would actually behave so it, Considering the same uh, case, so uh, again, um, this is a building unit wherein we are applying a load in this direction. So for walls two and three, actually the uh, load is acting perpendicular. But as far as wall one and wall four, they are in the direction of the wall. So uh, sometimes uh, these are the walls, what we call as shear walls. They are the ones who are going to resist the lateral load. Uh, we will see more of this in the coming slides. Similarly, we talk about how uh, a roof would actually, a roof which is resting on two walls uh, is going to behave. So usually the general structural action is whatever the load that is being uh, subjected uh, or the building is being subjected. So there should be a, a, a more organized way of the load being transferred from the roof to the foundation. So in order to ensure this, there is always necessary for the roof to have a good connection with the wall. 
Uh, speaking of, uh, so because we are talking so much about how the earthquake loading acts on a structure and how different components actually behave. Uh, so uh, coming to the part wherein we have to actually estimate the earthquake load to which these different types of structures are subjected. Uh, IS 1893 uh, part one, 2016, uh, mainly talks about how to estimate the earthquake load uh, for any uh, given structure by considering the geographical location of a structure, the importance factor, the soil conditions on which the structure is resting, as well as the um, uh, reinforcement detailing or what we call it as ductile performance based on that so yeah uh, most, most of you may be familiar with this i will just give it uh, uh i'll just brush it through for completeness so the zone factor obviously we have a seismic zoning map which has been provided on our code and we take each of these zone has its own z value that we take it as a zone factor and similarly, depending upon the importance of the building, whether it is a hospital building or school building or it's a residential unit. So depending on that, there is a different value of importance factor. And depending upon the soil condition on which the soil is resting, again, we have a factor called as SA by G. And R, uh, whether it is an ordinary moment resisting frame or is it a masonry building or is it a special moment resisting frame or it's a steel building, depending upon the ductile detailing or the reinforcement detailing in a structure, even the R value is decided. And then finally, the horizontal acceleration coefficient is multiplied with the seismic weight of the building to get the actual lateral force that is acting. Uh, so uh, this is just, uh, I, I just wanted to give a brief update of what is the status in India uh, when it comes to recording of earthquakes. So the um, all over India, there are numerous stations that are being installed. We call this as recording stations the red triangle that you are seeing here there are different government agencies as well which are maintaining i mean these agencies are responsible for installation and monitoring and maintenance and everything those stations that i'm showing here has been maintained by national uh, center for seismology under the ministry of earth science uh, similarly there are other organizations such as institute of seismological research which is located in gandhinagar or uh, ngri that is located in hyderabad and and also there are many other private uh, uh, investors as well who are actually monitoring the seismic activity around in all around all about around india so as you can see here uh, these are the stations which actually detects uh, and records an earthquake and of course the entire branch of earthquake engineering has been able to develop based on these on such recordings and on such observations itself because nobody knew what exactly was happening so everything that we know today is based on our own experience uh, uh, itself so uh, coming to the numerical modeling so before the slide we try to understand how to estimate a seismic force of course there are more complex methods such as pushover analysis time history and there are different ways of you can actually analyze and also how of you're applying the lateral load to a building so i have just shown a very simple way of quantifying the earthquake load but coming to the uh, understanding the behavior of the structure to this earthquake loading uh, so what we call it as a numerical modeling uh, this numerical modeling is based on the uh, assumption or simplification that any building has three important factors one is its mass or weight the other one is its stiffness and the third one is damping so these are the three main uh, characteristics of any building so which can be visualized using this uh, simple idealization as i've shown you the mass is given uh, i mean is represented by this block the stiffness is represented by the spring and the damping is represented by the dashboard of uh, uh, what you're seeing here and now this could be subjected to any force and you can obviously expect some sort of displacement and this is written in the form of a differential equation and of course this is this can be solved and you can get the solution and everything uh, similarly, uh, if this is just for a single story building, the one which is on the left and the one which is here in the bottom, this is actually for a two story building. So again, uh, like I told you, each uh, a floor unit will have its own mass, will have its own stiffness and will have its own damping. So uh, this is one of the slides that I've taken from my supervisor's uh, presentation. Uh, so severity of ground shaking at any given location 
during an earthquake can be minor, moderate, or strong. So uh, whenever we talk about minor shaking, so I'm, we are talking about events in the range of uh, two magnitude two to magnitude three, three, 3.5 or even four. So uh, we might as well uh, be, exp I mean, uh, there might even be an earthquake happening right now as we speak, but when uh, these earthquakes are of small magnitude, we cannot feel it. So maybe that is why we don't get to know most of the time, but these small magnitude events are always picked up by the instrument. So this is something minor shaking that can occur frequently and may go unnoticed to human beings. But when we talk about moderate shaking, this do occurs occasionally and there is strong shaking that occurs rarely. So these are some of the things that we understood over the years. So in order to make a building earthquake proof that is very expensive and that is something that has not been tried so far, because making it completely earthquake proof is not it's, I'm, I would not say it's not possible. I would say it's too expensive and we have to go into great amount of detailing, which may not be worth it given the a rareness of an earthquake or a major earthquake occurring, at least in India. So what is our earthquake resistant design philosophy? So whenever we have a minor earthquake, our uh, building should be designed in such a way that there is no structural or non-structural damage that has been experienced. Whenever there is a minor earthquake, there we can expect some amount of non-structural damage, but there should be no structural damage again. And whenever we, uh, it's in the context of a major earthquake, uh, there could be some amount of structural damage and the non-structural damage could be enormous. But the main intention in any of the design philosophy all over the world is to ensure life safety and also to keep the building operational for safety evacuation of the occupants in a building. So first, uh, let's talk about characteristics of earthquake resistant design. First thing is always the configuration. When, whenever we are talking about configuration, it could be the vertical irregularity or the horizontal irregularity. So what I'm trying to say here is, as long as the plan of the building is very simple, like you can see um, in this case, uh, the top one, which is just a rectangle. So these are all very simple shapes and they do not uh, uh, attract uh, concentration of forces and uh, load transfer mechanism is relatively easy. So you don't see much damage if the configuration is very simple. On the other hand, if you have uh, these kind of sharp corners, what you can see here in a plus uh, shaped uh, building or in a T-shaped building, these joints will actually uh, have huge stress concentration and most of the time the damage gets actually initiated from this corner. So these corners act as a weak point for the entire building and that is why as far as possible from earthquake resistant perspective we should always try to keep it uh, configuration as simple as possible and uh, another remedy to go ahead with that is uh, if we at all, if we want to have a T-shaped building or a L-shaped building, it is always better to actually separate it at the joints and make it as two separate units so that each unit will behave independently. So th this is nothing but two rectangular units just placed in that shape. So uh, next I was talking about a vertical irregularity. So uh, as you can see here, uh, in the first cases where what we call it as setbacks. So again, um, any building, whether whatever, whether it has been designed for a gravity load or it has been designed for a lateral load, the intention is to make sure that the forces are, are being transferred from the roof to the uh, foundation in a smooth manner. But whenever we have these kind of irregularities, the load transfer itself has to follow a very complex path. And in the uh, journey of a load, moving from one component of the building to another component, there could be some sort of stress concentration and which leads to damage. So which is why most of the time these kind of uh, configurations of a building needs to be avoided. Next, coming to the strength perspective, uh, many of you may already know in earthquake uh, design, uh, one of the things that we follow is a strong column weak beam design because we treat a column uh, failure as a global failure and a beam failure as a local failure. That is why we would rather have a beam to fail than a column to fail because a beam, if it fails, it's going to be restricted with a floor. So that is one of the uh, policies that uh, has to be followed. And the third thing is resistance, sorry, stiffness. So whenever uh, we have these irregular shaped structures or irregular placement of different structural units, 
uh, there is a possibility that the center of mass and the center of stiffness or center of resistance may not coincide so if you see the first one here which is just a simple portal frame here both center of mass and center of resistance are coinciding and hence even if it is subject to lateral load you we won't we may not see much of torsional forces uh, developing but in case of this where they have placed an asymmetric shear wall to one side of the frame whereas the rest of the frame is just empty automatically the center of resistance moves towards the shear wall whereas the center of mass remains in the same uh, position so obviously the distance or the gap between these two acts as the eccentricity and also this acts as a lever arm for the moment to actually rotate so this is what we call it as unbalanced uh, resistance and also this could lead to undesirable uh, deflection and deformation behavior in the structure the last uh, thing uh, that we always focus whenever we are designing a building for earthquake resistance is the ductility concept of uh, so we would rather have a structure or a structural member to behave in a ductile manner because they offer us sufficient warning before they undergo failure this is why we always would like to have a ductile behavior the reinforcement so as like i told you the entire uh, specialization has been built up based on the previous earthquake experiences so in rural areas uh, most of the time buildings are not designed uh, or it is not even constructed uh, uh, with proper uh, skills or skill they don't use skill labor or they don't have sufficient knowledge so it is more uh, these constructions are mainly from the locally available material and with local experience only so that was one that was one of the things and that is why there was a lot of damage which was seen during buj and also during some of the major earthquakes that took place in the himalayan belt and also most of the buildings which are located are unreinforced masonry buildings so obviously these are more vulnerable to earthquakes and in addition to that during buj earthquake uh, there was a lot of uh, damage that was observed in amdabad so these were the buildings uh, which were like rcc buildings but still they suffered damage because they were not compliant with the codal provisions so uh, obviously using the seismic design code practice is very important uh, so these were some of the lessons that we uh, learned now coming to the innovation part uh, so i have uh, divided the presentation into materials and then the uh, structural uh, forms so first we will be seeing the materials aspect as uh, we saw in the previous slide we always want to make sure that the building is ductile so structural steel is one such uh, commonly used material or it is one of the futuristic material i would say at least for india because uh, in abroad uh, or in many other countries most of the structures that we see are steel structures but here we are still using rcc to a greater extent so at least from that perspective uh, we would have to focus more about using the steel as they give us a more ductile kind of a behavior another one interesting thing that has found applications in numerous parts of india and as well as in other parts of the world is the lightweight materials such as wood bamboo so these materials have very good uh, weight to strength ratio and that is why they perform extremely well in the event of an earthquake and there are some futuristic materials like shape memory alloys uh, which are also being uh, used but most of this research is still at the laboratory level at least in india and probably in the future days they could find more applications in real life so i will give uh, some examples of having used these alternate building materials to ensure earthquake uh, resistant uh, design i would say so um, before going to this because uh, i will not be talking much in detail about the shape memory alloy uh, one of the interesting characteristics of shape memory alloy is that it can endure heavy strains and it can regain its original shape upon the removal of the load so many engineers are are actually experimenting with this this is this is called as a smart material so many of them are trying to replace the steel and concrete with this or uh, with this uh, smart material it could be a partial replacement also but yeah the research is being going on so what exactly are these uh, shape memory alloys made of so they they are usually like the name itself says it's an alloy uh, of uh, nickel titanium or 
uh, and it's about 10 to 30 percent uh, more elasticity it actually offers 10 to 30 percent more elasticity than steel so the shape memory uh, alloys were tested at a laboratory uh, scale in one of the uh, universities in nevada reno uh, so they actually compared the uh, seismic performance of a bridge so uh, the, uh, the bridge was made of uh, columns that were made of steel and concrete like the one what you usually use and they had made another uh, prototype which was made of concrete and this shape memory alloy and they found that the uh, prototype which was made with shape memory alloy actually outperformed the traditional material so that is how like i told this is still at the laboratory stage but it will see some uh, applications in the future hopefully so yeah this is about shape memory alloy and coming to the use of uh, cardboard tubes so uh, there is one such example wherein a cathedral was actually built in christchurch new zealand using about 98 giant cardboard tubes so one of the advantage of this is that these are the materials that are locally available so we can reduce the transportation cost and it's abundantly available so we are also making use of uh, or uh, uh, locally available material and these are extremely lightweight and they're very flexible and they perform much better actually than the concrete and if worst case scenario even if the structure of this form actually fails it it is far less likely to crush the people gathered inside so they do not cause much loss of life as compared to the traditional reinforced concrete type of a building so initially this type of uh, technology uh, began with a Japanese architect by name Shigeru Ban. He had uh, designed several structures uh, using the cardboard tubes and also polyurethane as the framing elements and so on. So yeah, this is one such uh, interesting construction that has been actually done. And uh, another one is probably this Actually, a few years back, this was not so famous, but now it has become quite famous. This is actually a textile industry or a firm. So they actually uh, they took this inspiration from the spider, which has the web, which the webs the spider cars were actually highly tensile. So they kind of tried to mimic the same thing. And since it was a textile firm, they were uh, they could actually manufacture the eye tensile twine within their own company. And these were made of carbon fiber and they were used as a reinforcement all around the building. So they actually showed uh, high tensile behavior and they could actually, uh, you know, uh, ensure good earthquake resistance to the structure. So approximately around 2000 uh, such high tensile rods have been used as a, for the reinforcement. So this is actually a structure which is located in Japan. Uh, in, uh, it's called as Komatsu Siren. It's located in Nomi. And this is another research, which is the last time I checked, this was still at the university stage. And they were just doing tests on some of the very simple structures. So this, this is a research which was developed in British Columbia, uh, wherein they have tried to come up with an alternative building material that uh, replaces the conventional sand um, by uh, fly ash and polymer based fibers and they have uh, they have tried to come up with an eco-friendly uh, cementitious spray so if the thickness of the spray as you can see here it it requires a very thin coating as thin as uh, just 10 mm and it was found to improve the seismic resistance so whenever they were doing the testing in the laboratory obviously they had subjected it to a 9 to 9.1 the hoku earthquake which uh, occurred in japan in 2011 so they found that even uh, a thin coating of 10 mm could actually improve the ductile performance so in the similar way uh, last time uh, like when i checked they were trying to do this for a nearby hospital and they were under on some of the schools and they were trying to see if this really has a real life application or is it just restricted to the uh, uh, you know laboratory level so this is in one of the ongoing research i hope and the next one is a carbon fiber wrap so uh, most of the uh, technologies uh, that we can actually implement in a building is at a construction stage. So the, we were talking about the spray or we were talking about cardboard tubes or tensile rods. All these things are something that needs to be done when the building is still constructed. But what about the structures that have already been constructed? So how can we take care of those kind of buildings. So that is so this that is where the retrofitting comes into picture. So that is when carbon fiber 
rap was introduced so uh, this is basically uh, uh, the carbon fibers uh, what you can see here sorry uh, these are just the carbon fibers uh, the they have this uh, binding uh, coating which is made of epoxy polyester uh, and uh, vinyl ester or nylon Th this actually creates a good bond at the same time these materials are very lightweight and they are incredibly strong as well so this is like more like a composite material but it also uh, gives a sufficient amount of uh, strength and uh, strength to the building so mo in most of the retrofitting applications or at least even after an earthquake has occurred usually the engineers or the workers they simply wrap the material around a concrete column or uh, even for a roof you can actually give it like as you can see here on the right side so these are thin strips that are being given with the epoxy coating and that has been uh, uh, placed and conjoined together with the existing structure so these composite materials are found um, to give 24 to 38 uh, percent stronger than the i mean these the structural units which have this wrapping they perform better than the structures without this wrapping and another advantage of this type of wraps is that they are non-corrosive and they are non-magnetic materials as well and so obviously this uh, in terms of durability this is a great step i would say so most of uh, most of the uh, inventions that we have today is being inspired from by from the nature so we always try to mimic what we are able to see it in the nature so one such example is that of a blue mussel this is usually found on the uh, along the coast of new england so as you can see here uh, the mussel is stuck to this particular rock and if you there is certain uh, length to its thickness ratio in this uh, what do you call it as sticky fibers i would say which we, they call it as basalt threads so they uh, uh, the scientists actually observed the capability of this threads or the fiber that is capable of actually uh, holding on to the stone even if the waves hit these muscles will still stay intact along with the rock but at the same time they're very thin they're very flexible and they're very lightweight so this is also an ongoing research wherein they're actually trying to bring this to the structure uh, point of view because the characteristics of this fiber is ideal for an earthquake resistant design so like this many such things are ongoing so until now we spoke about some of the ongoing or uh, existing innovative materials especially to improve the earthquake resistance so the next one that we will be talking about is lateral load resisting structural forms so many of you may already know we have moment resisting frames we have shear walls we have a dual system and so there are different uh, structural forms that are actually available today uh, especially for uh, resisting the lateral loads so uh, first we will uh, again uh, because we have a majority of masonry type of buildings in india so uh, i would be more inclined towards discussing about the improvements that we can make to masonry buildings for ensuring a better earthquake resistance so uh, if in previous earthquake experiences and also i'm sure you have seen it in earlier presentation the weak spot in a masonry building will always be the wall between the two openings that is the wall between the door and the window opening so usually they serve as a weak spot and that is where the wall actually collapses first and then it will lead to the damage to the other parts of the building so uh, one of the uh, takeaway points from such experience was to keep the size of the opening uh, as minimum as possible first thing and second thing around the opening the to give a correct reinforcement the steel bars should be placed in the correct amount so that they can offer sufficient ductile behavior so that whatever the additional load that is coming from the wall above is being carried by these steel rods and then it is being transferred to the adjoining steel rods and so that the, you can actually protect this opening and there is no collapse of the wall so that was one of the uh, uh, things that uh, uh, they observed first thing and second thing is uh, using of low porosity block see most of the times whenever we are constructing the brick is actually pre soaked 
and so that the absorption of water from the moisture from the atmosphere becomes very less if we are using a low porosity bricks so that is one of the, uh, one of the um, suggestions that many people had after having experienced numerous earthquakes so during buj earthquake uh, the buildings which were similar to that of a box actually performed very well as compared to even rc buildings so that is when they understood the significance of having a simple building configuration so uh, what happens when we have a simple building configuration is the entire building behaves as a single unit so that is what uh, many people have attempted to do over the years so there is something called as lintel band these are nothing but rc bands or a wood uh, bands that could be so these are placed at different levels in a structure for example let us start from the bottom uh, there is always a plinth uh, band so this is usually provided at the plinth level then at the sill level there is something called as sill band and at the lintel level we give what is called as a lintel band and again so depending upon how many stories you have you have provide that many uh, bands as possible and the reason why they are giving uh, the bands at different levels is so during the earthquakes they observed that uh, at the lintel level there was a damage at the sill level there was a damage so the wall components used to fall out from the structure so in order to make sure that the wall uh, component remains intact they decided to keep these bands which will ensure the entire building to perform as a single unit so that there is no separation of roof from the wall and there is no separation of the uh, uh, wall from the sill or from the opening so just to make sure of these things they were, they were providing these bands so what exactly these bands are composed of they are mainly uh, it could be a reinforced concrete band as you can see here the steel bars are placed in a certain configuration and then uh, the con uh, concrete is being poured also uh, there are cases where they have used wood uh, in place of steel because especially whenever we are constructing it in hilly areas where wood is abundantly available but transportation of steel bars could be uh, uh, not could be expensive so in such cases they have made use of wooden uh, sleeper kind of a structure as well so uh, whenever we are giving uh, this kind of a band it behaves uh, very well and another interesting thing that they found is that there was a two thing in the wall which would also give a good connection between the corner member and the wall unit which i will explain it in the coming slide so i just want you to remember that there is possible to give a two thing action on the wall so uh, confined masonry uh, uh, some of you may be familiar or for some of you it might be new what exactly is a confined masonry construction is this is one of the best uh, i would say uh, building technology that we have because we make use of the same building materials that is if if you want to go for an rc frame with a masonry infill that you can still go for a masonry infill and you don't have to even reinforce the masonry you can use an unreinforced masonry wall so there is no new material that is needed it is still the same material that goes in the construction and the second thing is it's just that the way or the sequence in which the construction is carried out is slightly different so uh, apart from it requires some amount of training or some amount of skill in the laborers that are working actually on these projects but it's relatively easy and also it offers a good uh, resistant uh, action towards earthquake loading so i am going to show you an example of confined masonry construction that actually happened in iit gandhinagar and this is one of the early attempts in india wherein they try to use this technology and even till date it's been more than 10 years now and still these buildings are, are safe and oh, they are performing relatively well so how exactly does the sequence of construction actually happen for usually it is our common practice that the columns are casted first and then the reinforced uh, masonry walls are being placed but in case of confined masonry what we actually do is for the reinforcement cage for the column is being placed at its own respective places but casting or the concreting was not done instead of uh, they actually construct the masonry walls so as you can see here there is a tooth or gaps as you can see between the wall and the 
uh, concrete or reinforce, reinforcement cage. So then the form work is actually placed in the concrete as support. So whenever the concrete enters this particular setup, actually they, they enter even the toothed action so that the column as well as the wall unit have a better bonding and they perform relatively better. So this is the student hostel. Uh, as you can see, this was also constructed using the confined masonry technology. And this was the faculty residence uh, that was also constructed. This is how the finished one uh, look, is looking. Uh, so that was about confined masonry. Next, we will talk about vertical reinforcement. So this is more, some of the advanced and this requires a little bit of a skilled labor, especially while uh, implementing this at the site. Uh, it's very simple. You just have to use a different kind of a brick, which has an opening and the vertical rods are actually placed and then it is grouted, as you can see here on the right. So the gap is being uh, uh, grouted and then as usual, the bricks are being placed in a usual unreinforced masonry wall manner. What exactly these vertical rods are doing is that it ensures a tensile behavior because most of the masonry walls, they're uh, weak in tension. It is similar to that of a concrete and it is even worse than a concrete when we talk about a masonry wall. So these additional rods, they actually give the tensile uh, strength, which uh, usually they lack uh, or unreinforced masonry buildings lack. So next, uh, this is one of the new technology that has come up and it has not been introduced in India yet. So this is about a porotherm uh, clay bricks. So as you can see here, this is not our conventional brick, they have a different kind of a structure. And you have this, uh, this is what they call it as a toothing action that is ensured from each block to another block. So that uh, th this uh, joint is where it's crowded and it is because of this kind of a toothing action, you it gives an excellent bond and also it increases the mechanical strength. And another interesting thing is it there is also possibility for us to use the vertical reinforcement like we saw in the previous slides. So this is actually a patent which is being filed by Wiener Berger. Uh, so they have actually uh, implemented this in real life and uh, there is also a structure which was constructed in Italy and that resisted the earthquake. I will show you in the next slide. So as you can see, uh, they have a, a mortar pockets uh, so wherein you can actually place it and you can, this is what we call it as a butt joint. So this, uh, whenever a butt joint is grouted, it gives an excellent bond. So this is the structure which was actually constructed and this is actually in, uh, uh, this, this one is in uh, Italy, but they have also constructed buildings in Croatia, Romania, and Slovenia. And the, these this technology has been really successful, especially in Europe. And yeah, maybe they will come to India soon. Uh, so this actually, uh, the this structure lasted uh, the Emilia Romagna earthquake, which happened in 2012. So this was one of the good options or viable options for improving the seismic resistance of an unreinforced masonry building. Another one is CISPRIC. Uh, this is mostly at a uh, research stage yet, I would say. What exactly is this? Is This is basically an isolator which is in the shape of a brick so uh, this uh, can this the, the shape of this is brick uh, can be usually of that of a regular uh, uh, brick as well and these are placed along with our regular uh, masonry wall so as you can see here they have these mechanical connections wherein they are tightened and they are improved uh, i mean basically these rods they improve the mechanical characteristics so how exactly these are placed? As the name itself suggests, these are the isolator blocks. So whenever we have, uh, I'm referring to the figure on the right, whenever we're talking about a freestanding masonry wall like this, but it has a beam and a column and everything. So if we assume the loading is acting at the roof level, obviously there is a separation of the RC unit from the masonry unit. So uh, automatically there will be uh, the leaning or the swaying of the structural member that is the column will impact a diagonal tension in the masonry unit and which is why these actually fail. So wherever uh, we see this maximum 
tensile stress being imparted from the structural frame into the reinforce or into the masonry unit, they are going to place these isolator bricks. That is why uh, the bricks which are in blue are those isolator bricks that are sorry. Uh, um, these are the bricks that are actually placed uh, along with the column. So blue bricks are the ones which are placed uh, wherever there is a junction between a wall and a column and the red brick is the one which is being placed between the slab and the wall so these they actually whatever the excess uh, load or the excess sway that is coming towards the masonry wall these isolator bricks actually absorb them and they make sure the rest of the wall remains intact so that you can actually prevent diagonal tension cracks from developing. So that was one of the interesting uh, things uh, about this blocks. And as you can see, you can use it even in a partial wall like this, or you can use it for a full uh, length uh, wall as well. So like I told you, this is still ongoing. Here, the, the red ones are the conventional bricks, whereas these are the these bricks that are they are using so they're still trying to optimize the number of blocks that are needed and also the location where these bricks needs to be installed in a wall so yeah the last time i checked they are still in that particular stage so until now we spoke about how to improve the earthquake resistance of a masonry wall now we will talk about the usual skyscraper kind of a structure and how are they ensuring resistance to lateral load because these are all multi-story buildings which are very tall and they whenever we are uh, constructing a tall building in addition to earthquake loading we always have the uh, risk of wind loading as well in fact tall structures are more likely to be subjected to wind loading than an earthquake loading so but the one plus point is that both wind loading as well as earthquake loading are lateral loads so the kind of design is more or less similar the design philosophy is similar so we are talking about uh, first is the shear wall so these shear walls are actually one of the useful building technology that helps to transfer earthquake forces these are usually made of panels uh, that actually helps the building to remain intact during any movement so these shear walls are often supported by diagonal cross braces and there are steel beams and there are different components actually as a matter of fact and um, that can be that can resist uh, lateral load so as you can see here this is a shear wall this is a typical shear wall building and it's quite common in most of the high story buildings and also the lift um, shaft is usually consists of uh, shear walls itself so this so that their uh, uh, lateral movement is restricted so this is one simple example of a tall shear wall building. Uh, this is a 23 story RC building in Poland. So the height of this building is 93.3 meter. The thickness of the outer core walls, uh, usually what happens, there is a higher demand for shear at the bottom than at the top. So that is why the thickness of the shear wall will be usually uh, higher at the base and it gradually decreases as it goes to the higher stories. So that is what uh, here I'm trying to say. So in the bottom story, it was around 600 mm. And uh, in the third and fourth story, it was around 500, 400 mm. Then gradually it moved to 300 and 250. So there is also a minimum thickness for a shear wall that is 200 mm. Irrespective of wherever it is placed in the building, the minimum thickness for a shear wall should be 200 mm. But again, you can increase the thickness, but you cannot reduce the thickness after 200, beyond 200. Similarly, there is something called as a bundle tube system. So now we are talking about uh, one of the first skyscraper that is called a Sears Tower. Uh, so how exactly was this type of a building constructed? So uh, this is actually how uh, the Belize Tower was actually constructed. Um, here on the right, you can actually see in the plan and then later on you can see it further. So the red unit or the red blocks, these are the central core portions that exist from the ground floor till all the 108 floors. So these are the central core of the building. So obviously their design level is uh, different from the rest of them. Then there is this purple component which exists only from first to 50 floors. Only the first 50 floors are this. This is the outer core of the building. 
then another outer core of the building is from uh, is extends from 50 uh, from the first till the 66th then there is a yellow component or the yellow building unit that stretches from the first to the 90 and in the top there is no other extra building units that are coming so the red one this is actually a central core and everything else is is like it's more like a tube kind of a structure so, so there are different tubes which are terminating at different heights actually so the reason why all of them have not been terminated at the same height is because for example if we consider the purple units uh at which is there at 50 story like i told you there is a higher shear demand at the bottom that is why you need all these different bundled units to act together in the first 50 stories because that is the uh, stiffness demand up to 50 stories but above 50 stories when the stiffness demand is reduced automatically we no longer need these purple units to extend that is when we just keep the green units then after we reach like 67th story or something the stiffness demand is reduced even further that is when we cut down even the green units and we just keep yellow and red and after again 90th floor the stiffness is reduced a lot i mean the demand has reduced a lot so we just keep the central core so here we are saving the material we are making it economical and also most importantly it is architecturally more pleasant and pleasing and it it looks like a skyscraper with some kind of technology but in reality it is actually made to uh, you know from a very technical perspective uh another type is uh, steel shear wall panels so these these are used differently they have unstiffened plates and stiffened plates in usa they mostly use unstiffened steel plate and in japan they use a stiffened steel plate so if we are using a stiffened steel plate you give those horizontal and vertical stiffeners which divides the entire wall panel into small individual panels so whenever these wall panels become small the tendency to buckle is reduced so that is one of the advantages when you have a stiffened panel next uh, bracings many of you may be familiar with it this is the jan and cock uh, center in chicago uh, so uh, as you can see here, the bracings are quite visible to the outside itself they ensure again lateral load and these are this is nothing but a simple moment resisting frame with bracings provided uh, so this actually reduces the overall displacement of the building and also reduces the bending moment and shear force demand of the columns another one is a dual system wherein we use both the bracings as well as the shear wall so this is like combined action uh, the red uh, uh, scheme what you're seeing here that actually represents the shear walls and the bracings are provided on the other side so they when we consider this dual type of a structure there is a reduction uh, in the column sizes that are needed actually uh, and also it reduces the demand Uh, which, which is being placed on a gravity load resisting structural elements so that is why we introduce additional elements so uh, until now what we saw are we make use of the same material that is reinforcement steel uh, uh, steel reinforcement and concrete and we try to uh, create uh, an alternative alternative structural forms but now we will talk about the different technologies that have come up over the years so um the first one is base isolation many of you may be familiar with it so as the name itself suggests we are trying to isolate the building from its base so the animation what it is showing here is whenever there is a ground movement the base is going to shake while keeping the building intact so that is the basic principle of any base isolation systems so this is um animation that was actually created to show the difference between a base isolated building and a regular building so this is the kind of action that is taking place wherein the base itself moves while keeping the superstructure intact so there are many different types of isolators that are available in the market today and 
uh, we will see about them. So there are different types of base isolation devices. One is elastomeric bearings, there is lead rubber bearing, there's a sliding bearing, and there's a ball and roller bearings. So uh, in uh, some of the historical structures, which they wanted to retrofit and ensure seismic resistance, they have there have been examples wherein the entire structural unit has been lifted or separated from the foundation then these base isolators are placed on top of the foundation and then the structure is being placed back to the original uh, uh, position uh, i couldn't uh, find some example maybe some other time i can share it with all of you uh, so there are there have been examples where they have used it as a retrofitting technique as well so one of the examples of a base isolated building, especially that is located in India, is there is an hospital uh, wherein, as you can see here, this is actually a basement car parking lot. And here uh, they have provided these isolators uh, between the column and the uh, roof unit above. So the reason, uh, sometimes even the location of the base isolators plays a major role because uh, at what level we would like to isolate the building from the bottom. And also there, uh, there is a um, building in IIT Go, um, yeah, it's, there's a building in IIT Gauhati uh, uh, where they actually have uh, tested this base isolation on an actual structure. Uh, similarly, uh, there are other examples uh, outside of India as well. This is a research and training hospital and this has been, there are lead, they have used lead rubber uh, bearing isolators and around three eighty six of them have been used. And this is another technology which is mostly in Japan as of now. Maybe in the future it would come, but there are certain drawbacks of this one. So this is what we call it as a levitating house. So this is a very simple, a single room kind of a structure, wherein it is fitted with a sensor, as you can see here. So whenever an earthquake is detected, because in Japan they have an earthquake early warning system, which actually alerts the citizens around 60 seconds to two minutes before the event actually happens. So the sensor actually detects that the earthquake is about to occur. And immediately this is fitted with a compressor here. So the compressor uh, actually pushes a huge amount of hair wherein the structure is actually lifted a few one or two centimeters above so that when the earthquake actually happens, it is the base which is going to shake, whereas the structure is already levitated. And then after one minute or two minutes, it comes back to its original position. So again, the drawback of this is you, you cannot do this kind of technology for a high story building or for a very uh, large uh, villa kind of a building. This is this is more suitable for a smaller scale application. And also though it, it could be very expensive because you we need a compressor that can actually push the air at a certain pressure that the entire house or the unit gets.
um sorry from where did you miss the presentation hello hello yes ma'am or from where have you missed the presentation to you i can share my screen ma'am uh, from uh, ma'am are you sharing the screen right now oh yeah i'm about to um but like was the call like was there till here no ma'am okay Ma'am, uh, levitating house. Okay. So after levitating house. Oh. Yes, uh, you were disconnected. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Actually, I saw the call, but I thought it was someone else. Oh, okay. 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 Ah, uh, sorry. Um. Um. Yeah. Let me know if I'm not there, or maybe I will only check. No problem. uh so uh, speaking of vibration control devices uh, this is so what we call it as a damper um this is an example of um, how a structure with and without damper behaves so as you can see here the structure on the left is not fitted with the damper the one on the right is so these dampers actually they absorb the shock and reduce the overall deformation so this is one of the advantages and some of the examples are there wherein the seismic dampers have been fitted so this is type a uh, tower which uh, consists of a tuned mass damper i will talk about tuned mass uh, damper in a bit so but these have around uh, 728 tons of dampers which are being fitted and whenever we talk about dampers it's the location wherein these dampers are located plays a crucial role in case of type a 101 these dampers were fitted uh, between 87th and 92nd floor oh uh, and also the, uh, these kind of uh, dampers are usually used in bridges and this is not exactly a new technology this is already used in many cases so this is another high speed uh, railway track which is located in taiwan and uh, even there you can see the lock up devices that is done uh, because we were talking about tuned mass damper in the previous slide uh, the what you call it as is a pendulum power what exactly uh, the pendulum power actually does is that due to an earthquake loading if the building is trying to move in one direction this pendulum moves in opposite direction counteracting the movement so the mass or of this pendulum should always be uh, capable of pulling the structure from the deformation so this is a uh, this type of technology is usually used in skyscrapers and one such example is the skyscraper which is located in tokyo and it's known as shinjuku mitsui building so these dampers are usually uh, uh, placed at the top of the building and uh, th th this is nothing but the mass which is being suspended by the steel cables as you can see i can say steel cables are used this is very expensive and uh, this type of technology is used only in places which is more likely or constantly prone to earthquakes that is the only case when this is actually used uh, next is um, invisibility cloak uh, this is a very interesting technology and the idea behind this was very good but there are certain drawbacks too so the idea here was to actually construct a concentric circles so what they actually did they have dug uh, concentric circles around a building and they have uh, in these uh, 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 what i can call in these concentric uh, circles they have uh, grouted with concrete or any other uh, shock absorbing material and uh, then uh, they have actually tried to uh, deflect the seismic wave and it is actually passing through as you can see here the waves actually come and they take the path around this concentric circle thereby avoiding the structure itself the drawback of uh, this type of technology is this cannot be used at a domestic scale because when the seismic wave is actually getting deflected there is a high chances of this wave going towards the adjoining building and therefore the adjoining building may suffer a higher damage than it was actually prepared for but 
the advantage of this type is this type of technology could be used in case of nuclear reactor because these reactors are usually placed at a very far uh, distance away from the city most of the time and they are usually located in uninhabited places so in those cases this technology could be really useful so uh, uh, during my PhD, uh, I did seismic hazard studies for Northern Kerala and Mangalore. So I'm just presenting it in just one slide about the study that I did. So this is the earthquake um, epicenters that you can see here in the skater plot. So here there is a shear zone. I forgot the name of the shear zone actually, but there is a, also a reservoir, a famous reservoir here located. This is somewhere near Wynard. So near the shear zone, there is a lot of earthquake activity that has been observed over the years. And even here the fault F9 and fault F10, these are highly seismically active, I would say, and we can expect uh, earthquakes in the future as well. So the lines, what you're seeing here, these are some of the lineaments and the faults that actually Actually exist in the study area and the earthquake events as you can see here these are some of the earthquake events that has been witnessed so during my seismic hazard studies we found that uh, IS 893 actually classifies uh, Kerala as zone 3 that is uh, the Z value is around 0 0.16 but our study suggested that the Z value is around 0 0.20 so the values what you're seeing here on the left side of the legend is actually the Z by 2 values so if we consider because we see more of the brown spots here i would take the maximum value say 0 0.10 so it's twice of 0.1.2 so 0.2 is quite higher and maybe kerala is more seismically active than we are ready to accept and given that um, we have not experienced an earthquake uh, or a major devastating earthquake so obviously we can expect one in the future in addition to uh, developing a seismic zone for the study area, uh, we uh, we had access to geotechnical information in some of the sites, which is located in Kasargod, Calicut, and uh, many uh, other adjoining districts. So we could actually develop the SA by G curve, what we see in IS-1893, the design spectra. So we could actually generate a specific design spectra for the study region itself. A little bit about the foundation that I work for. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization based in Pavia. Our, uh, we have like uh, numerous partners all over the world and we work on numerous projects uh, in different parts of the world. Our main interest is seismic hazard and seismic risk. So um, we have uh, collaborators all over the world, like I said. Uh, we have some collaborators in the Nepal and uh, in uh, northeastern part of India as well and in northern India. Uh, but the collaborations what we have with India is relatively less as compared to other parts of the world. Uh, so at the moment, we are currently working uh, along with the China and uh, South America, Greece, UK. And uh, there are some nuclear power plants which are coming in UK. So we are working for them as well. So in addition to working in collaboration with different companies and organizations, we also um, conduct trainings. The reason why we conduct these trainings is because we have an open source uh, software called as OpenQuick Engine. Some of you might be familiar with the software, whereas some of you may not be familiar with the software as well. OpenQuake Engine is an open source uh, software which is used for hazard and risk calculations. Uh, so we give trainings uh, uh, to university students if anybody is interested and are interested in working along with this. So uh, we give them trainings and uh, also we conduct workshops. Uh, so as you can see, this is some of the places where we have actually given workshops so far. Uh, unfortunately, in India, we have not given yet. Uh, but in September, we will have one in Assam by CSIR NIST uh, that is located in Jorhat. So we, we are giving a training there. So of course, we are more interested in training a larger population, maybe in South India or somewhere in the North as well. Uh, but if anybody is interested, they can always reach out to us and uh, even we encourage people to use more open source software and there is always Google forums that are open and if you have any trouble with the software, there will always be someone who's going to answer it, all the queries and so on. So in addition to training and collaboration, this is some of the hazard maps that we have provided uh, for all over the world. So our intention is to increase the earthquake awareness among the people, uh, impart preparedness, 
and also help certain industries wherein they work with the insurance perspective. I mean, in India, insurance is not a very famous concept, especially for the buildings, but um, in most of the uh, abroad foreign countries where the buildings are more prone to earthquake, they have a building insurance as well. So our models actually help such insurance companies in deciding the premium for the buildings and so on. So that is what we mainly work for. And uh, more, uh, given the condition in India, we, because we are not used to earthquakes, so maybe we, we might not be that prepared in the event of an earthquake. So I usually uh, end my slide with, with, with a slide on earthquake safety. So uh, given that we have not experienced a major damaging earthquake, there is definitely a possibility of having a big, great earthquake in the future and maybe in the near future as well. So whenever there is an earthquake, first thing to do is we should always take cover under something that, that is more sturdy. First thing, protect your head at any cost and turn off electricity gas because these are some of the secondary accidents that happen, fire breakout or electric lines are cut off and there will be oh, danger everywhere. And then avoid the lifts and always take the staircase and stay away from the beaches because tsunamis are always followed by earthquake. And if you are located very close to the Ili region, there is always a chances of landslide and rock fall. So it is better to stay safe from them as well. And always stay uh, yourself uh, informed and also you should be, uh, you know, able to co communicate or contact other people. So it is better to stay in groups and ensure good communication. So these are some of the points that you have to make sure in the event of an earthquake. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take it now. Ma'am, I have one question regarding yes. your study in uh, Kerala. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, it is quite alarming that uh, 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 set factor of 0.2 has been reported. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, in uh, yeah, can you quote the reference where you, I mean uh, where have you published it, ma'am? Uh, can we get more details regarding the same? Uh, okay, I can share the link uh, to the publication where I think one of the publication was there in the earlier slide, but the probably other one is not there. So yeah, I will just share the link in the chat window here if it is okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, for, uh, I, there is a question, how to reach open source uh, software training. Uh, actually, uh, uh, there is we give we give out these announcements so it's better to watch out on our website uh, wherein we announce whenever there is an online training that we are giving uh, before this pandemic we used to do the offline training itself hands on workshop that used to be very useful for students but now because everything is on a remote uh, basis so we do conduct online training so it's better to watch out um, in our website i can even share the link to our uh, website as well so that you can keep uh, an eye on that and whenever there is a training you can enroll it's free everything is free of course we don't charge for anything so i am posting the link for open quick training as well so you can watch out the space and whenever there is a training you can enroll automatically but if you are specifically interested in a university or something then you have to uh, approach through your head of the department or someone a higher authority they will have to approach in if it is at that scale If there aren't any more questions, 
participants, please uh, unmute and ask any queries which you may have. Hello, madam. Yes. Yeah. So, ma'am, you uh, mentioned about those uh, bricks, no? Cis bricks. Mm -hmm. uh, they are implemented at IIT Gandhinagar. No, cis bricks are not implemented. Confined masonry is implemented in IIT Gandhinagar. Cis okay. brick is still at the laboratory stage. Yeah, so they are not available in India. No, not as of now. Who invented actually uh, originally? I think um, this was a company based in Germany. I'm I'm not sure. I, I will have to get back to you on that because I don't remember the manufacturer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Nice presentation, madam. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So if there are no more questions, I think we can wind up the session. So thank you, Shayesh ma'am, uh, for your I mean, you shared over the course of your presentation, you shared a lot of valuable information, which will be very useful for all the researchers uh, among the participants. And in general, also regarding earthquake uh, safety, you shared a lot of information regarding all that, which is very, very useful for all the participants, I'm sure. And on a personal note, regarding Kerala, you put up a rather alarming uh, <laughs> uh, uh, means a state regarding that, because we take everything for granted. In Zone 3, we, we, we have not had any major earthquake. Yeah, and we take it for granted uh, regarding the earthquake. So no, I it, hope, it, yeah. it's good if we never experience an earthquake, but it, it's always better to be prepared for it, and uh, not uh, I mean at least uh, comply with the codal provisions whenever we are constructing something new. It would be better. Yes, ma'am, and thank you very much for the presentation. You have included uh, all the recent advances in uh, earthquake resistant materials. Uh, new materials and technology regarding bundle technology, levitating house, all those were quite new for uh, most of us, uh, I believe. And thank you very much. Uh, the presentation was very interesting and uh, 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 very much. I mean, it was quite a wonderful session. Thank you, ma'am. On behalf of the Department of Civil Engineering and all the participants, I would like to extend our extreme gratitude for uh, sparing your valuable time and taking this session. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yeah, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Hope you all enjoyed uh, the lecture. Yeah, maybe talk to you soon, sometime in the future, maybe physically rather than virtually. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, dear participants, please join for the next session at uh, 2 15 pm by Dr. Sadesh Kumar. Uh, please don't miss the session as it will be very useful with a lot of videos, etc. Thank you very much. <laughs>